I'm so happy to be here and so encouraged by the fact that we're in this auditorium full of parents that clearly still care so deeply about marriage and about sexual integrity and how the you know how this affects their children. Um, you know, here we have a, a group of parents that that somehow has has maintained a commitment to the truth about these issues in, in raising their children, you know, against a cultural onslaught um, in opposition, you know, that opposition doesn't start uh, in college, it's certainly there, um, but it starts long, long before that. Um, but now, now your kids are getting ready to head off to college, um, so I'm gonna expand a little bit on what Ryan had to say about what's really happening. You know, he spoke a lot about what happened uh, in 2005 and, and uh, before. And I have a few updates, some perhaps dismal, but also a lot that are hopeful. So um, bear with me. I think we might, we'll start with some of the tough stuff, but it, it gets better. Um, college in particular is, is the sort of place where characters that are already largely formed, are really molded in the ways that give them the final preparations they need to enter into adulthood. And sexual mores are particularly integral to these years of formation because this is, this is still a newly developed part of a person, uh, and yet it has such bearing on the entire future um, of an individual, in particular because you know, decisions surrounding family life are so important. Now, universities were once understood legally and culturally to, to have this particular role in shaping character um, and inculcating morals. Um, the principle of in loco parentis uh, gave colleges this legal right to act, literally in the place of parents, out of concern for the life of the whole student. Um, and that included in areas uh, surrounding sexual morality. Um, you know, so this, this led to ways that, that this would be enforced. Um, you know, curfews and, and all of this was, you know, common if we sort of think back, probably actually two generations. Um, but that's, of course, all, all out the window. Um, student social lives are no longer sort of punctuated by curfews and, and monitored by house mothers. Um, and even though this, this legal construct, uh, you know, went out with the sexual rev went out with the incoming of the sexual revolution. Um, that's gone. Colleges are absolutely anything but out of the business of shaping the moral understandings of young hearts and minds. Um, rather, as as Ryan uh, spoke of, the ideology of the sexual revolution really has uh, gained and maintained a foothold in America's universities. And these administrations knowingly believe that their role ought to include inculcating this, this ideology, this belief system in its students, thinking that it's for the student's benefit. Freshman orientations regularly feature programming meant to raise awareness about campus sexual assault, but in fact have the effect of normalizing the hookup culture you know, making the college experience seem impossible to enjoy or even participate in without having lots of casual sex. Uh, as long, of course, as, as Ryan uh, so aptly put it, as long as there's consent and that latex sheath. That's a nicer word for it. Uh, <laughs> but so effectively, this, these, these programs that go on at the beginning of the year when freshmen arrive on campus that supposedly have the goal of educating students to be protected from sexual assault or to be to listen when their friends tell them that something has happened actually have the effect of normalizing the hookup culture um, and, and 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 really they invite students to participate in it Right, to participate in this culture that, that is ripe with opportunities for the very harm that these kinds of orientation programs are trying to supposedly address. So what is the hookup culture exactly? I know there's a lot of chatter about the hookup culture and 
the blog sphere and occasionally, you know, a, a big newspaper article shows up in the New York Times exposing the hookup culture. But basically, it's a social culture typically fueled by alcohol in which sex is viewed as recreation, dates are non-existent, communication is necessarily very low, feelings or attachment of any kind are expressly forbidden, and the expectation of relationship is out of the question. And, and I think as Ryan referred to before, pain, heartbreak, desensitization, loneliness, the inability to experience genuine intimacy, anxiety, depression, addiction to pornography, the list just goes on and on, um, are frequent ramifications um, for those who, who are involved. Um, and in spite of the rather obvious consequences that I just named a few of, students are really given the impression from authorities within the university that this is what they ought to be doing. They ought to be participating in this sort of life because that will somehow lead to them having, making the most of their college experience and self-actualization and fulfillment and all of this. And, and, and campus women's centers and LBG centers and other things like this provide institutional support for this particular set of beliefs about sexuality and marriage and human love. And they teach them as if they're the gospel truth rather than what they are, which is one of many competing academic theories. And so just to mention a few examples of the kinds of events that are hosted by these centers that that Ryan mentioned earlier. Um, Princeton, for instance, hosted a, a BDSM activist to teach students about kink last, uh, last spring. You know, as if after Fifty Shades of Grey, somehow violent sex needed a publicist. Um, UCLA brought in a sex expert to teach kids how to use certain techniques, uh, certain masturbatory techniques to de-stress during exam week. Um, sex week is now a common feature, typically around Valentine's Day, that's now at Yale, Harvard, University of Chicago, uh, it's trying to start at Emory, and, and many more. Porn screenings are the tip of the iceberg for weeks like, like this. Um, all orientations are celebrated, including those who are somehow naturally oriented towards infidelity. Uh, and the sad thing is that these events really fly under the radar of parents and the national media. So we hardly can keep track of, of what's going on. And what I'm telling you about are, are stories that we've heard firsthand from the students that we work with. Um, so we know that there, uh, you know, for, for every story that we hear, there are dozens, if not many more than that, that we don't. Um, and, but what's more unfortunate and more harmful to the students is that this single-sided approach to matters concerning sex leads to disrespect for competing ideas and then disrespect for the students who espouse them. So why am I going on about all of this? I'm, I'm not trying to scaremonger. I am by no means trying to dissuade you from sending your kids to college, even big, scary, liberal, secular colleges, which can be great places. I also highly recommend Princeton. Um, no. Lots of really awesome schools out there. Not trying to tell you college is a bad place. No, Ryan and I are bringing up these rather gory details because this is an information session about sexuality and the campus culture, and the details of that are gory. But more important than that, I think you, know, you need to know the reality of what's going on um, in order to understand the how and the why of your role in all of this. And I'll get to that in a minute, but for now that you, you should know that college is still a great place full of amazing opportunities, brilliant scholars, wonderful friends, incredible adventures, really, you know, money poured into all kinds of really wonderful, fun student activities, too. Um, and most students still ultimately want the right things. You know, research shows over and over again that students still value marriage as an important life goal. In spite of what we hear about everyone 
in the incoming, upcoming generation thinking marriage is outdated. You know, a recent study came back showing that 9% of 18 to 22 year olds think that marriage is an outdated institution. That's 9% is hardly a whole generation. The problem is that they don't realize that so much of the way they live their lives in the here and now, you know, on campus, affects the future. So our poster campaign for Valentine's Day a few years back actually connected those dots for students in very glossy ink and posters all over campuses uh, a, a few years ago, um, really encouraging students to think in that direction and pointing out some of the best uh, sociological evidence for the way that decisions students make now impacts their future. Students, students want to go on dates. In fact, there's a professor at Boston College, Carrie Cronin, who has gained fame or perhaps notoriety, depending on your perspective, for her class in which one of the assignments is actually to ask another student on a date, a real date, um, in which you know, sexual integrity is, is a requirement of that date. Um, but genuine romantic interest is also. Students actually uh, end up signing up in droves for this class just to be forced to, uh, to ask someone on a date because that's how non-existent dating is on college campuses. And yet, students still want to. Um, so we're just delighted that we are able to bring Ms. Cronin to speak at our seventh annual national conference this fall. Uh, our sixth had over 300 uh, registrants. So we are, we are just really looking forward to this conference this November, and there are flyers in the back, I believe, um, that we would encourage you to come. But we are we're really excited that, that, that uh, Ms. Cronin will be at the conference um, teaching students ways that they too can promote a healthy dating culture, even though they won't have themselves <laughs> the authority to assign dates to their fellow students. Um, and last week, for instance, students at Providence College during orientation sponsored a, a minute to win it game show, uh, mini games during a student, a big student activities fair to open up the conversation about healthy dating on campus. Another, another problem is that the students are hurt by the hookup culture, but they feel alone. Uh, they don't realize that it's actually quite normal to experience all the things that we described earlier. So our, our orientation poster campaign this fall, which you saw uh, in the hallway, seeks to address just that. You know, letting men and women know that it's perfectly normal to want more than what the hookup culture offers, and frankly, to feel hurt by it. Just last weekend, Donna Freitas spoke at Columbia. She's the author of a book called The End of Sex. Um, and she spoke about the powerful, though often very private, yearnings among these young men and women to find real love during college, despite the dominance of the hookup culture. And uh, a very lively and lengthy and, in Donna's words, intense conversation ensued. Clearly, her message was hitting home with some. Young men and women today want love, relationships, and intimacy, but they don't know what that even means. Because remember, the messages that they're getting from the university is that all you need is consent and that latex sheath. <laughs> uh, and by the message that they're getting, I mean that RAs are viewed as basically free condom stores and that during Valentine's Day, it's very common for condom grams to be sent as like cute messages from one person to another on a college camp, you know, maybe as a fundraiser for different groups will we'll do this sort of thing. Um, so our groups have done a couple of things to counterbalance that. For one thing, at, at Stanford, every year, they pass out flowers around Valentine's Day. Who'd have thought flowers Valentine's Day instead of condoms? Uh, but uh, it's, it's controversial, if you can believe it, um, which you can't because you've been listening all evening. And, uh, and at William & Mary a few years ago, actually a group of students there uh, very actively lobbied and petitioned 
to keep um, a condom, a new free condom dispenser out of their student center. And fortunately, we do have folks who can teach students about real love, real intimacy, real relationship. Speakers like Professor Jay Wojciechowski from UT Austin and Dr. Alexander Proust from Baylor have become unofficial regulars on the LFN campus circuit, uh, speaking about their respective work on the nature of human love, sexual and otherwise. And more importantly, the personal witness of a group of students who embody a, a, com a commitment to sexual integrity and are willing to publicly stand up and, and, and tell their peers that this is what they're committed to and stand up for the reality of what love looks like does more good for their peers than can ever be measured. But I know you're not just here to listen to us talk about, you know, all these terrible things. Um, but what you, what you really want to know is what this means for you and how you can tangibly prepare your son or daughter and help him or her you know, make that college experience the really wonderful opportunity you dream that it can be and frankly that it probably will be. Um, so first, keep doing whatever you're doing. You know, continuing to form your own children to become the young man or woman that you would want your daughter or son to marry. You know, this is what you've been doing for 16 or 17 or 18 years, so don't stop. Stay close and stay involved in your child's life. Obviously, there's such a thing as smothering and, you know, helicopter parents and all of this, but you're, you're still their mom and their dad, and your kids need to know that. Pay attention to the kinds of events that are being hosted at the schools your child is considering. Usually you can find these if you do a little digging online at the campus calendar, if you look at the different groups. It takes some digging on, on university websites, but they can usually be found. And talk to your kids about them. Remind them that even though after a year at college with dozens of these events going on, they'll seem normal, they're not and that the myths of a harmless hookup culture are just that, they're myths. On college tours, don't be afraid to ask questions. Just as our student fellows bear witness to the truth about sexuality and to their concerns, simply by raising their hand and challenging a professor in class when he or she you know, tells only one side of a particular argument, uh, you too can bear witness just by expressing your concerns and letting the other parents in that info session know that it's okay to have those concerns. You know, to be concerned about the sexual climate on campus or the imbalanced treatment of ideas. Ask what freshman orientation programming includes when it comes to sexual education and sexual assault awareness. Politely ask, what resources are available for students who espouse traditional values? Ask if they have a campus center for such students. My guess is they don't. Um, as yet, we, even with all the work that the Princeton Anscombe Society has done, um, even with huge alumni support and all of this, the, the administration has, has rejected it uh, for the foreseeable future. But if we have enough parents asking questions like, what resources do you have at your university for these students? This is, gonna, this is going to make a difference. Every question adds up. You know, ask if they have an Anscombe Society or another Love and Fidelity group. See how the tour guides and admissions officers uh, and personnel react when you answer those questions, when you ask those questions. Um, I'm guessing they're not ones that they get very often. And then once you're paying tuition, really pay attention. Go back, check those calendars regularly, find out what's going on, write letters, make phone calls, don't be silent about your concerns, but always be measured and polite, and gather a group of parents together, you know, meet your, your kids' friends, find out who their parents are, get a group together of, of concerned parents. It doesn't need to be anything formal, per se, I mean, that would be great. But just approach the administration when, some, when you're concerned about something. 
Um, but in doing that, be educated, know the academic arguments, and meet the university administration on their terms, in the language of reasons and arguments, not in, theolog uh, not in theological language, and definitely not in hysterics, even though that could be tempting. Our website, which is full of video lectures from all of our past conferences, as well as uh, is a resource library like the original resource library in the Anscombe Society's webpage, but uh, largely developed over the last seven years, um, is, is a great place to go um, for articles on these topics to get educated um, on what's the side of the story that's, that's not being taught. And more specifically, if, if you or your child does want to get more deeply involved with the Love and Fidelity Network, we would be delighted. Bring them to our conference this fall. Typically, the conference, it's in Princeton in November, uh, typically limited to college students and some recent alumni, but we would be more than happy to make an exception for you know, rising seniors who, who are really interested in you know, starting their college experience off right. Um, and, and getting involved. So please uh, take a flyer in the back if you would like uh, more information and, or talk to us. And please do encourage your children to find out if there's already a group on their campus. Um, check out our website, loveandfidelity.org, and click on find a group, or just email us, and we're happy to put students in touch with, uh, with the leaders that are already active on campus. And if there's not a group, and they want to get involved, we'll set them up with a starter kit and help them launch a new group. We love doing that. Um, and if they do, please, for yourselves, consider becoming an advisor to that group. You know, organizing parental support for their mission and initiatives. Um, consider financially supporting a particular activity of the group. Um, and if you're dissatisfied with university programs and services, just, just never be afraid to speak up. Right, you're paying tuition dollars, those, those speak. Um, and please also consider joining the Love and Fidelity Network as a friend of Love and Fidelity. We've found over the years that the student groups flourish the most when they have a strong community of support surrounding them in every sense of that word. So we recently started a new initiative to expand our network to include new friends and supporters. So for a very nominal donation of $15, you'll get this really awesome Friend of Love and Fidelity magnet. Uh, but much, much more importantly than that, you can join us in our mission to build the next generation of leaders for marriage, family, and sexual integrity. Because after all, that's really what you've been doing for the last 17 years. We're just here to help. So thanks so much for the opportunity to be with you tonight, and uh, good luck with everything in the college application process. It's going to be great. Um, we'll be here uh, afterwards to, to chat, um, and we'll also have some time for Q&A. Um, but before we do that, I would just would like to invite um, a few of our recent alumni and some current students to, to stand uh, who are willing to, to chat with you afterwards. Um, so if, if if you guys might just stand up and, you know, be identified. <laughs> so it's, it's really, well, these guys and, and dozens more actually at this point, you know, hundreds that have come through our doors uh, over the last seven years um, that are really on the front lines of everything. So maybe give all of them a big pat on the back, too, because we just get to work with them. They're the ones that are actually out there uh, on the ground, on their campuses, and making, making college a better place for all of you who are applying now. So thanks, everybody.